Hello, and welcome to Diminishing Returns. Uh, this week we are covering Split. With me as ever is Sol. Hello, it's me. I'm I'm Sol, and uh, Sol. Hey, yeah, it's me. Uh, my name's Sol as well. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, there's 26 of me. <laughs> and, and we all have very distinct personalities. <laughs> And they're all knobheads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And that—that that isn't me. That's uh, that's Alan. There's only one—one right. one of him. One in a million. There's only one Alan Church. Oh wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other one you haven't heard yet is Calvin Dyson. Hello. Yes, it's me. <laughs> Hello. Oh, it's Miss Patricia Calvin Dyson. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely uh, Calvin's favourite character in this film. How did you know? <laughs> so Split. Yeah. Uh, yeah. M. Night Shyamalan's... I mean, I want to say his triumphant return to making respected cinema, like films that get pretty good reviews and are popular and make money. But it does feel very much like it's not a film my mum will have heard of. Put it that way. It's it's a mm. it's much mm. more of a B list film, like a kind of. Mm. But it did do very well. It, it made a lot of money. I think the overwhelming opinion was that M Night Shyamalan had come out of his rut. I don't think any of us really expected him to pull it off. I don't know. I know Alan doesn't like it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you feel, Kevin. But it. I don't know. It. It. it I think we all felt like at best it was going to be a kind of light little similar to the previous film he made. What was that called? The Visit? The Visit, oh, yes. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think our, our kind of best hopes for it were another The Visit, weren't they, if I remember correctly? Which was certainly a lot better than expected from him at that point. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, I, I really like Split. Calvin, I remember, just to set the, the context out here... Obviously, this is a, a film set within the same universe as Unbreakable. It's something of a sequel, kind of, to Unbreakable. I'm a huge fan of Unbreakable. I think I gave it 10 out of 10. Uh, Alan had a lot of respect for it, I remember. Quite mm, liked like it. it. Calvin never liked it. It didn't click with him. Too slow. Mm, mm. Now, my, I would have thought that you would have liked Split, Calvin, because it's a lot more trashy. And, uh, <laughs> like, born out of horror nonsense, and mm, it has mm. a lot more stuff in it that you like. Well, I think, I, I think we made, I'm, well, I made it clear in my, in the M. Night Shyamalan episodes that we did a couple of years ago now, I think it is, um, that, yeah, I'm really not a fan of his, I think his favourite, my favourite film of his is The Village, which... <laughs> I don't know what that says about my taste in his films, but oh, for the I most part... I thought you were I... quite a big fan of M. Night Shyamalan. It's just... Yeah, no, I, I really passionately dislike most of his films, actually. The Happening, Lady in the Water... You thought The Visit was alright, though, didn't you? I think you were on the Yeah, same... I thought The Visit was alright. So this is why it's taken me, like, two years to get around to Split, and even when, like... Because I remember asking you guys about, like, okay, what is the big twist? I don't really care. And you said, oh, it ties into Unbreakable, and that put me off wanting yeah. to see the film even more because I just really don't like Unbreakable. But yeah, th- this will have overtaken The Village as my favourite M. Night film by, uh, by quite a way. Yeah, I, it, uh... it really just seems like a film filled with stuff that you would really get off on, which is, yeah. you know, <laughs> like serial killer Norman Bates kind of tropes. The um, mm. what's the old woman mm. therapist do? Betty Buckley, who, yeah. <laughs> who I, you will definitely love to pieces. Yeah, yeah. And like I say, kind of trashy horror elements, which yeah, which but done to an extremely high standard. I would say, you know, it's it's yeah, it's not low budget horror trash. It's it's really well shot, really competent, really well acted film. On the rewatch, um, um, mm. I was really looking at the craftsmanship behind it on a technical level, and it, it's it's a really well written film. Actually, um, mm. it really mm. kind of harks back to M Night Shyamalan at his peak. He still has a way of directing actors to say those lines. Like I don't know, I don't. It doesn't stick out to me in like any other you know director writer 
um, combination. But with him, it's some of his lines, and uh, it only happened a minimal amount of times watching Split, but it just occasionally, like, someone would say a line, I'm like, oh, God, that's such an M. Night delivery. Like, I don't know how he <laughs> instructs them yeah, to deliver the line, but they're always mm. so stilted. But, I mean, there, there wasn't much of it in Split, I didn't think. Yeah. Um, and, like I say, I think the performances all around are... Uh, uh, pretty great. Uh, James McAvoy is very much the one people focused on because mm. he's doing something that's going to get your attention, which is, you know, playing... How many characters do we actually see in the film? He's, he's a guy with multiple mm-hmm. personality mm-hmm. disorder. He has, he has 23 yeah. distinct personality. Well, 24, sorry, distinct personalities, but we only see about, yeah, four or five or six of them. Three of them get a good amount of Airtime, I guess, which is, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong on the names, there's Dennis, mm-hmm. um, yeah. who is like your main villain guy. And even then, I'm not quite sure, because like when he goes over to the psychiatrist, he's playing a part of this like New York Yeah, he's painter. pretending to be Barry, but he's actually Dennis. Exactly. That's, yeah, so that's I don't know if that I, really counts. I was really aware of on the rewatch is how it's such an odd way to introduce this character in this world in that we kind of first get a sense of him having multiple personality disorder in this weird meta sequence where he's playing, he's pretending to be a different personality to the one mm-hmm. that he is. Mm. Um, it, it seemed like a very odd decision to kind of introduce mm. us to the concept that way. But I loved it. I loved that they didn't go for something too basic and obvious. They went for something really quite interesting. And I don't know, it just, it's it's classic kind of Hitchcockian shit, isn't it? Where she kind of knows what he's doing, but she can't call him out on it, and mm. it's it just makes it a lot more interesting. I, I think it's a very... It's the decision of a, a very good filmmaker, a very good writer. Mm. No? <laughs> no? No, no, I think his career has, uh, yeah, firmly established was that he is... Neither of those things, but occasionally <laughs> well, he will make. I think make he can be. I, I think he can be, and he he went because you watch those early films of his, The Sixth Sense onwards. The first three, you would argue, the first four. Well, no, you probably wouldn't include The Sixth Sense, but I'd say his first three films are very, very well made, and there's stuff in a lot of them that turn people off. You know, Signs has weird religious stuff people don't like in it a lot of the time, for example. But in terms of what he was trying to do with them, they are, like, fully, fully successful and incredibly well-crafted from, from you know, from the craftsmanship point of view. I don't know, I really feel like he's kind of had a bit of humility beaten into him. <laughs> and perhaps he's learned to look at his work objectively or let Jason Blum uh, tell him what's what. or so I don't know. Mm, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> something has happened and he does seem to be on the up now and kind of back to making films well. Yeah, but whether or not that's entertaining is another thing. Like, I find him fascinating just as a, like, how his career has progressed and... I can't think of many directors where I've seen pretty much every film they've made, bar mm-hmm. one. You know, I'm always going to be interested in what he does, but I I mean, more, you know, certain, even speaking objectively, more than 50% of his filmography is, like, real shit. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And I'd, I I'd agree with that. I, yeah. Accolade. Yeah. Anyway, we have discussed his entire career before. Yeah. 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 So let's, yeah. let's focus on Split. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, Calvin loved it. Sol liked it. <laughs> I think I do close, love it. Close, I, I'm I, close to loving it. I really, quite. I had a great time in the cinema when I went to watch it. I was really like into it. I don't know how much of that was like boosted by the little unbreakable bit at the end that got me really happy. <laughs> Um, that that was the worst bit of the film. <laughs> yeah, I think objectively it, it it's badly written just sort of tacked on and stupid but it still got me completely buzzed i was watching it with my boyfriend and when that bit played he was like wait what what is that about i have no idea what is going on and i was like Who, who's that that's bruce willis well yeah i know that but who is he <laughs> that's explain oh well he was this character in a old film that this director yeah, made. yeah but it's, it's a mid credits thing you can shove anything it isn't 
It is. It's not in the mid credits. No, no the, cre- the split it... title comes up, and that's the start of the credits, and then uh, it happens. Fine. Anyway, I I rewatched Split the other day, and I was expecting it to be not the best in the world. I was expecting to think, yeah, it was good, but not amazing. No, I was really impressed. I think I liked it more the second time round. I, I I really kind of like I say, I was really focusing in on viewing it as a proper film rather than just letting the story kind of play out. And uh, I think it's very, very well made. Well, I think I had a similar experience, really. Um, I didn't particularly like it when I first saw it. It actually wound me up a bit. It was just yeah, I think you annoying. gave it a 5 out of 10. Yeah, then. and I, I, my second viewing of it the other day was, was better. I think it was because yeah. I knew what was coming. I kind of knew what to expect. Yeah. So the kind of disappointment that I had in the first viewing, in the, yeah. this this great setup that I was going with and then let down by an ending that I don't particularly like, I think there's a lot of that is more down to personal taste in the sort of films that I, I like yeah. and that it's, it's mm. setting up for this this real film or this sort of uh, an exploration of this particular mental illness and there's got all this like teen horror thing like going on. Yeah. And then it kind of just forgets about all that. So do this, the like, take the last half hour off this film and I'd be a lot more favorable to it, basically. Hmm. I think if you just sort of put a button on it with like the last five minutes, you actually see this switch of him into like a different kind of character. Maybe that would be easier to take, but it's it, it happens and then we have to kind of deal with it and we have to deal with him as a character. Yeah. And it lo- loses me. But that's not my only complaint. Um... How do you feel about James McAvoy? Uh, I can't shake the feeling that he's a bit miscast here. I think he does I an admirable. Yeah. Think he's miscast. Yeah. I think he does an admirable job of being an actor and like being a director's tool and doing what's asked of him in the role. I think it's a very good performance, but mm-hmm. I just think someone else would have suited it a lot better. It's just not right somehow, and he is a great actor, no doubt. And he embodies the character as well, but it's like you can see him doing it. It's like you can see him working it out as he's doing it somehow. Mm. And, and I just think you need someone who's more malleable, like physically, that can yeah. change themselves more um, to give it a bit more of that sense of change. But also, because he does it, but I just think there's not that much to change. Someone with more of a, more of a rubbery face, do you know what I mean? Someone who can just show... F- like probably someone who's not as good an actor and is overdoing it a little bit. Um, I think he's a bit too subtle. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. I, I, I believe, um, I believe we spoke about this last time around again, but it was originally meant to be whacking Phoenix, wacky backy Phoenix mm. in the role. <laughs> I think there was some scheduling issue. Or there was something that meant that very last minute he had to drop out and be replaced. So McAvoy wasn't the original vision for this film. I do think it's kind of a real shame because I, I think Joaquin Phoenix would have been better. He seems like mm. he would just fit that part a bit more somehow. Well, Jared Leto. Oh God, Jesus Christ! <laughs> but like I say, I I still think James McAvoy does a great job, and it, 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 it it's it's good enough that I can go with it very happily. My main problem with it is that I I never felt scared when everything yeah. else that's going on, how it's written, like the shots, like a, so much stuff in here is like textbook how to, you know, make a movie that will scare me personally, like slow, quiet shots, just yeah. like, there's that one bit where um, one of the girls in the cellar wakes up and he's just like crouched in the doorway just like sat there staring at them like a maniac and um they're all just like wake up wake up and then like that is an image i find quite scary but because it's james mcavoy it just doesn't really work yeah i, I don't know if it's because i just don't find he him seems very scary friendly physically he? he seems yeah. like too much of a nice guy that it just doesn't quite <laughs> yeah. play You're right you just said something there calvin that resonated with me that i don't think is this film supposed to be a horror? Because well, actually, now I think yeah. about it, there's not really any horror elements to it, are there? I think, nothing I think that, so. that really works. I think you're right, actually. I, I, I don't really watch this as horror, but I think it is yeah, meant yeah. to be scary, yeah. I, That's what I, I thought. I think that is a failing on the film's part. There's one bit at the end, I, I think when you see him eating that woman, Oof, uh, yes. that girl, I think that's quite disturbing. 
And I think that mm. is quite mm. effective horror. A lot of it's because the film felt quite tame up until that point. It's quite a big leap. Yeah. Mm. Quite an unpleasant thing to happen. So I do think mm. that's one moment of legitimate horror in the film, but it's one scene and nothing else really stands out to me as. I think, scary. yeah, maybe when. In the opening of this film, it's very much sort of established as a teen horror kind of thing. It's these teen girls, they get kidnapped, we don't know what's going to happen. And it, I think it's deliberately setting it up as that kind of genre yeah, film, and then it switches. Is, yeah. But the, the perhaps this is why it doesn't work very well on that level, because the James McAvoy th- character threat never quite works. There's always this sense that there's something bigger going on. And and like when he when they first kidnaps them and he's the scary one and he grabs one of them, it's a bit rapey rather than murdery, um, mm. and that is uh, that looks, I think that works. Um, but then it's kind of quite immediately deflated as well. And after mm. after that point, he he's never in any other characters is really a direct threat until mm. he turns into the beast or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I, you never yeah. feel like he's just going to come in and smack one of them with a hammer or, or anything like that. It's kind of like mm. you're waiting for them to get out somehow. Like something's going to happen. Well, that's why I thought they had the one girl escape in the first place so that he could kill her or do something terrible and then we worry for the last two girls. Yeah. But he doesn't. And I think you needed that because I needed to really be afraid of this guy. Because like, especially the bit when the first time the girl escapes and she's in the locker... And he runs past and then he comes back and he's looking at her through the thing and he's saying, come out, come out. And she does. And then he makes her like take her top off and stuff like how that's written, I think is really creepy and scary. And I was waiting for that moment where he's just going to have a big outburst and do something terrible, but he never does. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And he always kind of, and I think it might be deliberate that we have to keep him as something of an innocent before yeah. the change so that we kind of can go with it. Um, yeah. maybe, I don't know, but it would be better if they had, like, look, it's split personality, have one of them that's just a total fucking lunatic who wants to mm. hurt everyone, um, and then the others are trying to, like, keep him in order or whatever. Mm. So, uh, let's talk about his different characters then. Um, okay, there's Dennis, who's a kind of neat freak, obsessive compulsive. It's the mm. first one we meet, isn't it? Yeah, he's the threatening one. He's kind of physically imposing. Well, he, he is your textbook stereotypical serial killer archetype character in this mm. kind of a film. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, um, and then we have Miss Patricia, who's kind of mm. the sort of prim and proper lady. Mm. Mm. And sort of set up very much as the leader of the gang of characters within the character. Um, mm. Mm. It's sort of a matriarchal role. Yeah, that, that never really pays off, does she? No, no, it doesn't quite. It just feels like okay, that's a different character. We can make a clear yeah. distinction. Yeah. I think her and Dennis are supposed to be the most morally reprehensible of the bunch. Yeah. And you get the sense that those two are doing the best they can to suppress the others. Uh, yeah, and then the other one is Hedwig, the, yeah. the young boy who is. The comic relief in the film is it? Kind is he? Of, yeah. I think it's supposed to be. I think he but is. Yeah, does serve a purpose though, and he's obviously he's the one that the captives can take advantage of to some extent because he's a child. They can manipulate him a bit more easily. Yeah, yeah. He's more there's easily. Some, there's some really nice dynamic uh, play between them in some scenes. I think where they do get into that, and then uh, Kevin Wendell Crumb. Uh, who's sort of the <laughs> the neutral quote unquote real him? But this was another bit of bullshit, basically that I didn't like. Where, oh, that you can summon was like, by saying his name? Yeah, so like like, like, like he's the nun. <laughs> <That Yeah>. <laughs> um, which they justified with the flashback where you see him as a kid and it's his mother shouting his full name at him to tell him off. So it's like, okay, it's a trigger for him. It's like, okay, that justifies it just enough to get away with it, but I still don't mm. like it as a concept. Well, you know why I think it's good, Alan? Um, <laughs> I, I know why you won't like the concept, I understand that. I think it's good and it works well here because it's set up as a bullshit get-out clause and then it doesn't work. It, yeah. it, it buys them a few minutes and then they revert back to it and then it stops working. It's a red herring, it's not an actual... Yeah, yeah. Means of saving the day. So I think it's absolutely fine, mm. personally. Mm. Yeah. If yeah. that had been 
if that had been a method of you know her escaping and having a happy ending then it, it would have annoyed me as well okay what about the therapist woman Betty Buckley. Betty Buckley. Played I by think, Betty from Buckley. The happening. I think it's an excellent performance. My main problem with her was not her particularly, but the writing her, and her role oh, is she... there to just do a lot of exposition. exposition. Yeah. And it really is not quite handled well enough. And she, I think she does as well as she can with it, but it just needs less of that or a bit better, deli- uh, better molding somehow. I, mm. I agree. It's, it's transparently a tool for exposition However, I think one of my weaknesses when it comes to trying to watch films objectively is I I, I rarely mind an exposition dump. I actually I typically quite like them. I, I quite like having a character who's just explaining everything or a moment where all the rules are laid out. And I think one of the reasons she works so well for me on that level is a lot of what she's saying is it's not like this is how this works. It's like here's a really interesting concept, like an anecdote that tells you a little bit about how this works. So, you know, the mm. the guy going, footage of a dog behaving differently around the different personalities doesn't mean anything. But then, you know, as viewers of the film, we think, oh, that is quite compelling. That is quite interesting. Mm. And within the context of a film, not viewing this scientifically. It's sort of like M. Night watched Psycho recently and thought, oh, that psychiatrist at the end is kind of necessary to explain everything, but if only he could be weaved into the story a bit more clearly. <laughs> so that's kind of where that came in, I think. Yeah. Uh, the other main characters are the three girls who get kidnapped. Yeah. yeah. And this is a bit of a false lead because it, then it t- transpires the film really is about the villain. Um, mm. So we have these three girls, it's immediately established, and one of them's a bit of an outcast, a bit of a kook. But they're just pretty typical teen girls. And I think they're really well characterized uh, and yeah. well performed in the sense that they feel like real teen girls rather than a 28-year-old playing yeah. Uh, yeah. A, mm. what a 45-year-old white man has written as a teen girl. Um, mm. So in that sense, it's quite good. I uh, On the first viewing, Anya, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, who plays Casey, the, the sort of protagonist of the film... I, I don't know, I didn't really pay much attention to her on the first viewing. She was very much just like, yeah, she was there. I think she gives a really good performance. I think there's a lot more to what she's doing in this than I kind of picked up on the first time round. Mm, mm. But yeah, and how her backstory unravels, like we have flashbacks of her as a kid on yeah. Do you know hunting what? trips I with her really dad and have, uncle. I could really have done without the flashbacks. Um, I feel like... There are far too many of them and involved the, to, for the payoff that we get. Yeah, like we we she's she's a bit weird and damaged in some way. I think we could there was there's a much easier way of just implying that without having to show us and yeah mm, in so I, much detail. I just didn't. It just drags it out for no no reason. I I don't mind the scenes, but I think you're right. They don't need to be there. I think they do. Like it gives her an arc. Yeah, like, she yeah. has this experience, and though it's not spelled out, I really love that at the end when the police yeah. woman comes to take her home, and she's like, "Your uncle's here," and you're sort of wondering, like, "Fuck, is her uncle still alive? Is she? Is yeah. he still a guardian?" And the look on her face is like, "No, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm ready yeah, to talk about." I it. really like that that this this sort of experience in her like that's threatened her life has then given her the strength to stand up against other things in her life. Yeah, I like that. I I just don't think I needed a sort of twenty minute short film of her camping yeah. and to tell me. Yeah. That. Mm. But I, I, mm. I quite I think they're good scenes. I think they yeah. work well. But watching this again, knowing that glass is coming out, I couldn't help but feel like maybe a lot of this was set up for her in the next film. Yeah, I was mm. thinking that as well. Um but I no, I, I think it works. I, I, I think it does give her an arc, quite a satisfying one. I, I I like that it imbues her character with this kind of it's a weird mixture of um having been a victim but also learning to survive. Well that's it, very much knowing how and, and in multiple ways, you know, learning to survive on a kind of emotional level, but also like she knows how to hunt things and Throughout the film, I, I do think it's played like she is. It, you can read it like she's too scared to act and stuff, but I think it it paints it as no, she's hunting, she's biding her time, she's yeah. waiting for the right moment to Definitely, strike. Yeah, and I think I think if this film was about her, it would be fine and it would work. 
but it's not. And it's just that imbalance of you're trying to tell two stories at once. That's why it doesn't quite work for me. Even though the mm. all the elements individually are fine, like the whole doesn't her. quite I, I, work. I think she's very much the protagonist of the film. She's the one with the narc. Mm. I mm. I think that all works. Um, just because there's a scene stealing villain who who gets a lot of screen time doesn't stop it being her story. Mm, I think it's yeah. his story. It's like everyone loves the Joker in the Dark Knight, but it's not. Like the Joker's not the protagonist, is he? Um, there are the girl's two friends. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One yeah. of which I thought was quite good. Um, the girl whose party it was. What's her name? Claire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Very and good. then there's the other actress who I thought was pretty appalling. Like, really? I, yeah, I thought she was absolutely dreadful. Yeah. I can't say um, I really. I didn't get anything off her really. Yeah. 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 I mean, she didn't. She has less to do than the other two. Yeah, I, I thought yeah. she was fine. I did um, really like how these two were written, though, because it'd be really easy to make them like mean girls yeah. and very unpleasant. But uh, not that they were completely uh, delightful. But there, there is still that one. Like as soon as she sees an opportunity for escape, she just sort of immediately goes for it and sort of doesn't really think about helping her friends out, which is probably quite natural for that I, kind I of think, situation. Yeah, I, but... I think they're very believably written characters I oh, think yeah. they're very mm, yeah yeah very, and, like, in, and even the interplay like they she's kind of invited this girl to a party as a kind of pity invite yeah. and she's a bit weird but they're not nasty to her they're just like oh, she's a bit weird mm. and she is a bit weird so it's not just like mm. they're bullying yeah. her or anything she is well, I really like the bit at the start when she's when the dad's like asking who is that girl and she's like well she's the only other girl in our class and we're inviting everyone else so <laughs> yeah, we're exactly. not monsters what would it do to her to be the only person not invited yeah, so yeah. I thought that was quite nice and I, the three are very distinct characters they yeah. they and they all react to this experience in slightly different ways which I really liked well that's it it's it's very easy to see how they're reading it one way but it's actually something else and I, I think that's quite a, an impressive thing to pull off and, it, as well and as I think it's does. it's very clear straight away it's not like a reveal later on it's like we we understand there's something going on with this girl and we're not quite seeing yeah. the full story and my my main problem with these guys were the how the the two kind of get away and then they're kind of forgotten about and they're used a bit later on for a bit of shock horror and then it all becomes about the one girl and it just oh, felt a I bit of a shame it, it felt like we had this big thing that, that then yeah. yeah but it just felt like they got dropped off a little bit and not quite yeah. and they, they are still very much part of the film and they're trying to escape and stuff but you know i think mm. if they developed them more and dug into them more to then give them such a horrible grisly end would just feel mean-spirited in a way that this film isn't because ultimately i think mm. this film is pitched as good fun B movie, enjoyable. I think because they are brutally murdered, it loses that. I think that is why. Because even Betty Buckley being killed, you can still get away with that. But th- those kids being killed after we've set them up as kind of decent people, <laughs> I think that like I does. Say, I, I, think I think it. it a... I think it is a big sort of flick switch in the in the middle. Of I the do. Film, yeah. Or, no. I, I, like I said, I think it's actually quite disturbing. But I mm. think it's a small mm. enough element that. You can still kind of go with this being like a, you know, a haunted house ride at a fair. Really, no, it, I don't, it, I don't know if I can go on. As with opposed that. to a kind of, I don't know. I think if you got to know them more and spent more time on them, it would just be so mean spirited and abrupt that it wouldn't quite get away with it for me. Mm. Uh, mm. Talking about the cast, what about uh, Big Ol M Night himself, M yeah. Dog? Yeah, nice, no, <laughs> perfectly fine cameo. That's yeah. that's the it level was... he needs to be working at. Isn't it? There, there's there is one very specific moment where he he just gives some appalling uh, acting. Uh, it's like his his eye re- acting, yeah. Yeah, she she says something sarcastic, and he kind of goes ooh with his eyes reacting to it, and it was just appalling. Um, worst worst performance in the film, but you know what? I'm all right with it. I don't mind him being there, giving himself a little Hitchcockian tiny... Well, it's more than that, isn't it? He's got dialogue. But... Yeah, he has lines. So that's... You kind of cited a scene there which is intended to be funny. Like, they have a little conversation about hooters yeah. and stuff. I just want to talk about M. Knight's sense of humour in general. Because <laughs> there, there are a lot of times yeah. in this where I'm like, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh. I'm certainly not creeped mm. out. No Laurel and But Hardy. I think... <laughs> 
I think that that might be the intention. Yeah, yeah. Or if it is just that strange middle line of horror comedy, I yeah, I don't really know. I think everything with Hedwig is is in this ballpark. To be honest, mm. it's. Um... But then they, they, it does it does have to strike that balance there because Hedwig is a very important character in terms of them getting out of the room and, and like and, mm. you know the, in, establishing the different characters. And, and a, a different approach to to this threat, so you can't just play, it's not just dropped in for laughs. It, it, it's yeah, it's being played seriously. But then there's these little weird comedy moments where he's like when he see, dances, you see him dancing. To... But that yeah, no, I wanted to talk about that dancing bit in particular. And I th- I think my problem is with M Night rather than James McAvoy. But I'm not sure. It's like I, I, M Night doesn't really let the audience in on the fact that he knows it's a joke. I don't think, and that's why I find myself like, I'm, I'm, "Is this supposed to be scary? Is it supposed to be funny? I don't know." Because he do, he never sort of tips his hat to what he's intending with it, and maybe that's intentional. But I, but the, it, but I, I, th- I know what you mean because when you're watching it, like on the page, it says it'll say Hedwig dances to Kanye West or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But then, like, the way it's filmed and it's kind of done a POV thing and James McAvoy comes up to the camera and says... Like I say, it's the bit where he goes, oh, and, like, shakes up towards the camera. It's very weird. But the, 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 the way it's shot makes it a little bit eerie and weird. Um, mm. Whereas if it was if it was a different film, it's just like, hey, this guy, yeah, he's got the mind of a child and so he does childish things. An adult dancing mm. like a child is not scary. But the way it's presented is, and obviously it's in a particular situation where she's shitting herself and she's trying to do all this stuff anyway. But mm. but yeah, it is a bit like, how much am I supposed to be laughing at this? <laughs> because it's definitely, mm. you know it's funny. And like when he kisses her and then he goes, you might be pregnant now, <laughs> that made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's an odd one. I, but I kind of like that. I like... I yeah, like that it's yeah. a bit off there. I like that it's a That's bit it. weird I, I, and I'm, I, I'm not sure how to feel about it. I was going to say, I'm okay with a bit of an ambiguous yeah, nuance about how it's pitched there. I don't mm. mind it. It's like, because I'm, I'm cringing rather than <laughs> yeah. laughing yeah. or being scared. And that's when I'm like, yeah. oh, this is the uncomfortable space. Because <laughs> certainly, I, like, I always hate it when people seem to act like, you know, you can't have a scary movie and a funny movie in, like, one package. Oh, you, yeah, um, of course you can, yeah. It's but hard. here it's... Oh, yeah, yeah, very hard. But it, but... it can be done. Yeah. But he, M. Night, I just, I don't know if it's just a sense of humour or what, but, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't work for me. Um, c- can we talk a bit about like when he actually becomes the Beast? Um, mm, yeah. Because like, while I knew this was in the same universe as Unbreakable, I was I didn't know I had no clue like how they were going to handle that. Yeah, yeah. And whilst there are physical elements to the transformation, I still think it's handled in quite a realistic way and yeah. uh i i really liked it to be honest yeah i did uh, i i get i was exactly the same although i'd had it spoiled for me that it was set in the same world as unbreakable again i didn't know how far they were going to go with it and what they were going to do with it. Mm. it It it's kind of just about within the realms of plausibility just about <laughs> I, I wish it was a different actor because I think with a different yeah. actor I would find this really terrifying. Yeah. But because yeah. it's James McAvoy, I'm just like, no. <laughs> but I, did, it's not I, I didn't. Scary. I didn't like it when he was he was like shouting scripture and stuff like, "Oh, the oh, the yeah. impure will be damned" yeah. or whatever the hell he's saying. It just felt a yeah. bit too kind of yeah evangelist rhetoric. Yeah. I don't know. It didn't mm. just didn't fit. If you're going to make him animalistic, then let's do it. Yeah, 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 growling and snarling and stuff. I don't yeah, know. It feels yeah. like that's and a whole extra element to the character that we haven't seen, and it's just sort mm. of started here. And it, they might use it later on. Fair enough, but yeah. Mm. Um, should we should we re-rate? Uh, Wait, my first ever rating. Yeah, yeah, I've changed my rating, so I think that's a crucial thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I gave this an eight last time, and honestly, on the rewatch, I was very tempted to bump it up to a nine. <laughs> But I didn't. So it's an 8, but it's a very, very strong 8. I gave it a 5 previously. I think that expresses my kind of frustration at it. There's just enough elements that I don't like that it's annoying that I like the others. 
Uh, and as we've as we've discussed when we break it down, there's loads of things in here that I like. I still like Shyamalan as a director. I think he's got a great artistic vision. But then he writes stuff that I don't necessarily like. <laughs> so anyway, this <laughs> particular one, I have bumped it up to a six. Hmm. Gavin? Uh, it's an eight from me. Oh. Uh, and, and looking back, because I had to look back at like whatever I gave The Village, because I'm pretty sure The Village is my highest rated M. Night film. And I did give that eight out of ten. I think Split is a much better film than The Village, for sure, and I think I like it a lot more. Maybe I'll have to revisit The Village sometime to see if it still holds up to that for me, but, um, yeah. So, Mm. I mean, so yeah, Glass is coming out. That's why we're doing this podcast. It is the sequel to both Unbreakable and Split. And it it seems to have a lot more... I, I was expecting it to be... Oh, it's Bruce Willis as David Dunn, Samuel L. Jackson as uh, Mr. Glass, and James McAvoy as uh, Mr. Split. What's he called? The Horde. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, they're all coming back. Like Samuel L. Jackson's mum from Unbreakables in the film. Oh, really? <laughs> Anya Taylor Joy's in the film. Like I think the the kid who pl- the guy who played Bruce Willis's kid is in it. Like grown up. It's like everyone seems to be coming back. And there's a shot in the trailer where you see like all three of them sort of stood mm. side by side looking on. It's like these are their, their ties to humanity. And weirdly, it seems like they're setting up Anya Taylor Joy Casey as a, a sort of like she's going to have some sort of ongoing relationship with um, James McAvoy. It McCormick, make, makes sense with, the, with how the film ended. You know, he kind of sees her yeah. as. Uh, something akin to himself, and so he, he leaves yeah. her alone, basically. Yeah. Um, they they bullshit it. They bullshit this whole thing that Samuel L. Jackson believes himself to be super intelligent, which wasn't in Unbreakable at all. Mm. Um, mm. The point of him was that he didn't have any superpowers, and he was like the opposite end of the spectrum. And so I'm not keen on that. I I'm not sold on the premise as it's laid out in the trailer. And then it seems like basically Samuel L. Jackson is going to be the the kind of puppet master who sets the horde free and runs a mock. And it makes sense. Mm. I'm excited to see it play out. It it all seems a bit conventional superhero action movie-ish for me. And that's not what I want from these. I want something intelligent and thoughtful. And I, I don't know. Mm. Apparently there's a big twist. You're kidding Um, let's uh let's do our ideas for Mm. i don't know a sequel a continuation some sort of addition to split Mm. i don't know it's i mean this is all just so much this kind of depends on what glass ends up being as well it's difficult Mm. i think it's good in a way that we can't predict what's going to happen i think that's Uh, yeah i agree yeah and I do, I do buy that M. Night Shyamalan does have a very specific vision for this that he has been mulling over for ages. I, like I say, I don't know to what extent it was originally the vision of Unbreakable as it was, but I don't know. I do, I do think he knows where he's going with it. I, it doesn't feel like an ass pull, you know? Mm. Um, I suppose the other obvious thing to do would just be the kind of Blumhouse multiple sequels to split as a horror franchise kind of <laughs> milk it yeah <laughs> but I, th- I don't know i don't think you could keep doing that with james mcavoy and the same guy it would just be a bit you'd have to have other characters doing the same thing and then that's a bit shit <laughs> i don't know i think i think you, you develop the girl uh casey yeah yeah and then it turns out she's like Super Ooh. marksman or something. She's <gasps> like super sniper. Oh, maybe I wouldn't ah. be surprised if they actually do that. I I do think they are going to um, dig into the uncle. <laughs> Her one weakness is incestual rape. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that can keep her down. <laughs> and so when she tells them and they remove the uncle, she's suddenly like unleashed on the world because <laughs> she's no longer being held back. <laughs> and she's a super sniper and she shoots everyone. Mm. I could see that being a twist in the film, that she's got powers. That That's the sort of thing they might do. Yeah, maybe she's super empathy or something like that. 
Oh, she's she can suggest she suggests things to people, like Darren Brown. He's sort of like a real life superhero, isn't <laughs> yeah, he? Exactly. I mean, obviously not, but you know what I mean. That's what I want. That's that's a new superhero take, sort of hypnotist mm. guy, but he's actually sort of controlling in some way. It's uh, him and uh, that Dynamo guy, <laughs> and uh, Penn and Teller, <laughs> and we can just have like an Avengers of illusionists. <laughs> That'd work. Yeah, actually, that's not a bad idea, though, is it? And in terms of, like we said, this kind of low key superpower thing. Mm. Yeah, someone who kind of has magic powers of some kind, it sort of mm. plays it off as magic. Could that be Samuel L. Jackson's character? Like he, you know, mm. he researches into hypnotism and shit. That that seems close enough to how he's established that. I don't know. That I, I could see that. I could see him doing something like that, and then that would make him legitimately like an actual supervillain without it testing the realms of believability too much. Or do you mean you want him to actually have some kind of ambiguity about whether or not it's a real power or not, like the other people? Yeah, on the same level that the others do, yeah. Hmm. I like the hypnotist guy. I think there's room to do a kind of quote unquote realistic take on that class because that is a very, very classic comic book villain. Mm. The mm. hypnotist guy, sort of fallen out of fashion, I think. Um, yeah, definitely. But, yeah. but I think it'd be very interesting to sort of hark back to that and see it done. It's the sort of thing Shyamalan would pull out as well. Yeah, yeah. It's all kind of 1950s style hypnotist. <laughs> How far down the line of uh, unbreakable sequel films do you think we'd have to go before we would have to like go to people shooting fire out of their hands, <laughs> that kind of stuff? Oh god, like, I don't think it would take that long, you know. I, I think you <laughs> you you'd get like like it wouldn't be out of the realms of believability that glass could have someone kind of produce like a water droplet from their finger and be like as a hint of, mm. and you'd only need yeah, like yeah, maybe. Yeah. Film five, maybe, is when they're just full blown, just like <laughs> Fantastic Four stretching their arms. Bruce Willis stretching mm. his arms out to <laughs> slap a flaming James McAvoy across the face. <laughs> and then Samuel L. Jackson mm. turns invisible. Do you think there'll be more <laughs> if this one's a success? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I think M. Night Shyamalan's categorically said there will not be another one. And mm. I think he has enough clout and creative control over all this that no one's going to try and make a, a cash in. But will will it spawn a, a rash of relatively low budget, kind of low key superhero things? I know there's been a few before. Um, um it'd be nice. The one if with it the, did. your your guy is it James Gunn did one? What's that? Yeah, called? yeah, super, love it. Super, yeah, that's, that's it. Like, very stuff like that. low budget, yeah. Yeah, but like this, this being much more mainstream, these split success, and then if Glass as well, that'd be nice to see. And like yeah, playing it, it would, down yeah. a bit, and like character-driven superhero stuff, I'd like that. I'd really mm. like that. Yeah, it, it would be really because pe- nice. Because people are looking for an alternative to just we've yeah. spent three hundred million to show these buildings blowing up. And, yeah, and I and I and, and I also yeah. think I think with Avengers four on the way, I, I think I said this before Infinity War, but it really does feel like. We're reaching the, the like the peak of this is the biggest film you could possibly make with it still making sense and having Avengers a, a... in space. <laughs> well, I mean... X Men are going to space next, aren't they? <laughs> they went to space in Infinity War. They literally already did that. <laughs> exactly. Um, Where do you go? Well, that's that? it. It's it's just there's nowhere left to go. So I think you need to start digging back and looking at more smaller avenues. And it, what would be really nice would be if this film makes so much money that it completely makes Marvel and DC reassess their output <laughs> and just think, like, yeah, maybe smaller... It's not going to! I know. No way. Well, maybe st- also, Logan, you know, I think these things are dripping through. Yeah. Mm. Uh, character-driven, like, things off the back of the superhero boom. I think there's room for more. So, glass. Can't wait. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested to see it, put it that way. <laughs> I will watch it when it's available on some streaming service. Uh, <laughs> but I will pay to rent it. As long as it's not ridiculous, obviously. I'm going to buy it at HMV. <laughs>
<laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and please do let your friends know how amazing this podcast is and help spread the word. If you'd like to hear more of our opinions on M. Night Shyamalan, as we discussed in this episode, we have done a previous Shyamalan season, looking at his entire career over three episodes, and that is episodes 31, 32, and 33, if you want to go and find them. You can find them at all the usual places where you get your podcasts, it'll be in the archives, and of course, you can find them on our website, dimreturns.com, that hosts all the episodes. And we're on YouTube as well, search for Diminishing Returns Podcast there. We have done other directors in a similar manner. We did a three-parter on Quentin Tarantino. And next week, we will be starting our three-part season on the career of Kevin Smith. Now that is just as much a roller coaster ride as Shyamalan. Oh, not that much of a roller coaster ride as Shyamalan. He hasn't quite plumbed the depths. We are looking forward to getting stuck into those Kevin Smith films. Please do join us, and we'll see you next week.